time or another in all of our lives, we have had to answer a roll call. And there's another one coming up. And I hope you know that when the roll is called up yonder, you'll be there. You'll answer present. I'm counting on that. I'll be there. I'm counting on seeing you. So you sing this song. You sing it with conviction. And this is your testimony. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. standing, the order of service may change somewhat from that's listed in your bulletin. Many of you know uh, this week one of our faithful people, Pam Johnson, went home to be with the Lord. And I know when the roll is called up down, she'll be there, no doubt about it. And Pam was just uh, faithful to me. I'll share something with you at the beginning of the sermon, but for now, I want to tell you a story that her husband told me this week that Pam loved to sing the doxology. I mean, just all the time in her home, even when she may not have had her mental faculties to do much of anything else, she would sing the doxology. He said they were in the hospital one day and some of the treatments, some of the tests, and he left her in a particular place and told her, just stay here until I get back. But when he got back, she was gone. They start looking for her, and nobody can find her until down the hall they heard somebody singing the doxology, and they said, there she is. Join with us as we sing the doxology. seated we ask our worship leaders to come and 
share this song as a tribute to uh, Pam and ask the uh, music director to introduce the song, if you would. Pam Johnson will never be forgotten. Anybody who's been in this church since she came here, I think about 2003, will remember Pam for her enthusiasm for singing in the choir and for her passion for missions. I know the pastor's gonna share something later, but I was missions leader for part of the time and I can tell you Pam was passionate about the collection of food and distribution of food. She grew up in a home where they were food deprived. And I've never known anyone yet that had as much passion about food distribution as she did. She also loved to collect uh, book bags and fill them. And she spent many days looking through uh, stores and looking through ads, trying to get the best deal she could to fill those book bags and so many other things that Pam did, but I guess the choir will remember her most for her love for singing. And this morning we had to sing the one anthem that she uh, sang part of a duet with uh, Sherry. And uh, in her memory and a tribute to her, we're singing Just As I Am. In the 19th century, a well-known minister was dining with friends. He asked a young woman sitting near him if she was a Christian, a question she was deeply offended by. But three weeks later, the two met again. The young woman told the minister that ever since that first evening, she had felt compelled to search for her savior, but she did not know how to find him. The minister told her, just come to him as you are. She accepted Christ that evening and not long after wrote the words to the hymn that has invited millions to come to Jesus ever since. Today it invites you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done.
And together as we honor the reading of God's Word from the book of Acts chapter 1, and we'll be reading verses 6 through 11. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the time or the season which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege of worship. And thank you, Father, for the privilege of once again hearing testimony that this same Jesus is going to come back and receive us unto himself. We worship today a holy, living, and saving God. We thank you, Father, that we too can come just as I am. You ask for no special preparation except that we commit our heart and our lives to you today, tomorrow, and forever. Thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to worship this morning it's important for us, it's a part of our life, it is our life, to come together with people of like faith and worship a loving and living Savior and praying that in this hour, the gospel will reach the heart of someone who does not know the Lord and they'll make that decision to invite him into their life and to know the joy, the blessing, the peace of the assurance that you can have by knowing that one day when the roll is called up yonder, we'll all be there. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated this time if you would. I want to extend a greeting to you from our heart this morning. It is just so good to be in the Lord's house. We always look forward to this time and and every Sunday is a new Sunday. Every day is a new day. And we're always looking forward to what the Lord has for us today that he didn't have last week and won't have next week. And so for anyone this morning who has made the effort to come here, we welcome you. And if you're visiting today, we want to have time to share a personal word of greeting uh, for you, with you, before you leave. Uh, the only way we can do that is for you to exit through the front entrance and exit. Uh, I know there are a lot of ways of getting out of this building, but I hope you'll take the opportunity to come and allow me to share a personal word of greeting to you. Some time ago, I heard it said that COVID is nothing to be messed with. Somebody should have told COVID that Ms. Dorothy is nobody to be messed with. <laughs> Um, it has been her desire to get back into church family, to worship together. And it has been her fear that that might not happen. But through the leading of the Lord, plans were put in place. And I want to thank Ronnie and Sharon Ward for making it possible for Miss Dorothy to be here and realize her heart's desire. And so, Miss Dorothy, it's so good to have you back this morning, 104 years old and still faithful to the Lord. How are you going to do better than that? I have to tell you, that's a blessing to any one of us and every one of us, and not just a blessing, but an inspiration. Try keeping up with her, and you'll be, you'll be doing okay. You'll be doing okay. want to also say that in the last few weeks, we've had some issues with the internet, Facebook, 
whatever it may be, and uh, under Andy's leading, have been working to find the source of the problem, and we feel like we're getting to that point where we have, uh, where we are really able to deliver a clear picture. Uh, this week, there was a new antenna uh, put on that roof, and some other changes, some other improvements, some new, new equipment here. And so for those who are listening this morning by Facebook and YouTube, I just want to say to you, thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience as we have gone through these necessary improvements and changes. And uh, I am confident that this morning or very shortly, your picture is going to be so clear, you think I'm in your living room. <laughs> and I will just tell you that I'll have ice cream with that cake, so, uh, but we're happy to have this outreach, this ministry, share the gospel, and this morning before I share God's word, I ask the Sanctuary Choir to come once again and share a message in song.
Thank you, Sanctuary Choir. In the summer of 04, I had the privilege of baptizing Pam Johnson. And from that day until the time the Lord called her home, the, she was the one thing the Lord asked us all to be and the one thing that everyone can be. She was faithful. In her, her choir, in her missions, in Bible study, she was here. And she wasn't just here bodily, physically. She was here in spirit. She put her heart and soul into everything she did. It's already been stated about her passion for missions. And she was the one thing the Lord asked all of us to be. Concerned about people who don't know the Lord as their personal Savior. And that is as it should be. Because it's one of the things that sets a church apart. It's one of the things that sets a believer apart. The scripture is clear. He that winneth souls is wise. And when we study the Gospels, at the close of each one of the Gospels, you will hear the Lord giving words of instructions to get the message out there. It's a divine mandate. It's really not an option on deluxe model Christians. It's standard equipment for every believer. And yet it's the one thing that most people, most Christians are reluctant to do. And in those gospel writings, it wasn't always the last verses, by the way. For instance, in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 21, he says, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. In the Gospel of Matthew, he said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even unto the end of the earth. And so that mandate has never changed. It's not going to change. As a matter of fact, the closer we get to the return of the Lord, the more critical it becomes. Dr. Luke wrote these words in the opening chapter of the book of Acts when he said, The former treaties, O Theopolis, have I written unto you of all that our Lord began to say and to do. And the key to that is he began to say and to do these things. But when he was taken up, and we'll talk about that in a moment, he left the responsibility to the church. He left that, he transferred that to us. And so the church has a great commission. We have a divine mandate. Tell the world about Jesus Christ. And the scripture says in verse 3 of that chapter that for 40 days he showed himself by many infallible proofs. In other words, nobody was going to be able to question the reality of a living Savior. The best we know in that 10 days he met in that 40 days, he made 10 different appearances. And the Apostle Paul said on one occasion, he showed himself to 500 people. I'll tell you more about that a bit later. But for 40 days, the Lord is going about showing people his resurrected body, showing people the scars in his hands and in his side and in his feet. They would know this is the Lord, this is the Savior. Yes, He is alive. Not only that, but He said to them, you need to wait for the Spirit. You need to wait because in your present state, you're not going to be up to the task that I have given you to do. You're going to need to wait until you be endued with power from on high. You need to wait until the Holy Spirit has not only come upon you, but is living within you. In the Old Testament, 
the Holy Spirit came upon people. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit within us, to live in us, to abide with us. You don't have to pray the prayer of the psalmist anymore. Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. If you have it, the Holy Spirit, if you have Him, you have Him from now on. You may not realize His presence, but He's there nonetheless. And so He said to them, you're going to need the Holy Spirit. No question about it. You've got to wait. You can't go out there in your present state and do what I'm about to give you to do because you're going to need the Holy Spirit as a reminder. The Spirit of God brings the teachings of the Old Testament and the teachings of the New Testament and the Word of the Lord and the prophecy of the Lord. Everything that you've ever had, the Old Testament prophets, the New Testament teaching, the Holy Spirit will bring that to mind. And by the way, this is why critical to study the Scripture. When you get the Scripture in your mind, the Holy Spirit has a way of bringing it to the light when you need it most. And so you're going to need the Holy Spirit as a reminder. You're going to need the Holy Spirit to retain what I've given you. Or you won't remember it all every day, every moment or every day. But when you need it, you will have it. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. That's the beauty of studying the Scripture, storing God's Word in your heart, in your mind. And in that moment when you need it, the Spirit of God will bring it to mind. That's the only explanation for it. That's the only way you can explain why you remembered it then and you, 10 minutes ago, you thought nothing about it. He wanted them to also, you're going to need the Holy Spirit for resolve. Oh, sure, it's nice standing around here while I'm in your presence and oohing and on and just talking everything good and everything great, but it's not going to be that way because I'm telling you, I'm sending you out there as lambs among wolves. And I'm telling you, they're going to hate you. They hated me, and they're going to hate you, and they're not going to accommodate you in any way, shape, or form because you're going into hostile territory. You're dealing with hostile people. And don't expect the welcome, which, by the way, you also need the Holy Spirit not only for resolve. So when you get in these things, in these situations, you are determined, I'm going to keep going. I'm not giving up. I'm not going to quit. The grace of God is sufficient. God has called me. And unless and until he changes his mind, I'm going to do what he told me to do. And when you get into those situations, you will also need the Holy Spirit to restrain you. Because I'm telling you, there are going to be times when you will want physically to take a hold of somebody. And i tell you how I know that. In the time when the Lord was walking with his disciples on earth, they came into a town that really didn't show them the welcome the disciples thought they should have gotten. You know what they said? Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven? We'll teach them these people to throw a welcome party. And so you're going to need the Holy Spirit to restrain you, to keep you from letting that human nature take over because it will do that. And so the scripture says that he told them to wait. Not only that, but they asked him the question. I guess maybe for whatever reason, if it had been weighing on their mind, I don't know why somebody in the crowd came up with this. But they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Obviously, that was an important matter to them. It should have been. And they wasted no time in being verbal about that, being vocal about that. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? He's going to do it. He is going to do it. The kingdom is going to be restored to Israel. But he said this, it is not for you to know the time or the season which the Father hath put in his own power. In other words, there are some things that are revealed on a need-to-know basis. And right now, you don't need to know that. As a matter of fact, he wasted no time in telling them, I've got bigger things for you. You've got bigger fish to fry. 
They're worrying about things that you have no control over and really are not of a matter of great importance to you. You've got other things, and this is what I'm telling you to do. I want you to know that you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, I won't get into that this morning. God forbid we don't have three days for me to explain all of this to you. But I'm telling you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that has just been absolutely torn apart through the years in what the Lord said and what He meant and what people will tell you today about the results and the responsibility of being baptized in the Holy Spirit and how you're going to act and what you're going to do if and when you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. All He said to these people is, listen, when you are endued with power from on high, you will be my witnesses. And a witness has but one responsibility. You tell what you saw and you tell what you heard. And that's it. It's amazing that we can talk endlessly with somebody else about good things that are happening in our life. But we can't talk to anybody about the best thing that happened in our life, which is the moment we trusted Christ as our Savior. That's all it is. You tell Christ, you tell people what you, Christ did for you. Tell, him, tell them how your life has changed. Tell them how you, important it is for you that they make the same decision and to have the same joy that you have. You're just going to be a witness. That's all he's asked you to do. Many people think, I don't know what they think he's ca calling us to do. But he said, you're going to be my witnesses. And you're going to be my witnesses in four places. In Jerusalem, which means when God calls us to be a witness, the first place he wants us to do that is in our own community. Talk to your own family. Talk to your own, your own neighbors. Talk to the people right where you live, right where you work. They are there every day. The mission field is right in front of you. It's right in your home. It's right in your community. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's the community. You'll be my witnesses in Judea. That is your own country. The interesting thing is we have in this church three primary offerings that we take up during the year for missions. One at Christmas for Lottie Moon. That takes care of foreign missions. One at Easter for Annie Armstrong, state mission. This is for United States. And by the way, if you don't believe that the United States is the greatest mission field on the face of this earth right now, you haven't paid attention to what's going on. Make no mistake about it. We've got to get the gospel. And that little poster that says, only Jesus can heal America. That is exactly right. That is our only hope. That is our only hope. And so you start at home and then in your own community. And then you go to your own country in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria. That is your own continent. We are to take the gospel. And if we can't go it's our responsibility to help somebody whom God has called out to do that, to go there. It's obvious we can't be everywhere, but we can help make sure, and Pam Johnson was committed to that. Make no mistake about it. I found out after a while that there were a couple people in the church who were designating a part of their offering for missions. And the financial secretary said, what do we do with this? What's this for? I don't know. I don't know who's giving it, but I'll trace it back through the county committee. And we found out that Pam was one of the people who was designating part of her offering as mission. And I just said to her, we need to know, where do you want this used? What do you want it given for? Her answer, wherever it is needed. And that leaves it wide open because the mission field is everywhere. And so 
when he's interesting thing. When the Lord said in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, it's interesting that not one of the apostles dared to go there. They had such hostility in their heart for the Samaritan people. They were the ones, by the way, they wanted to call down fire and consume them when they didn't think they gave them the proper welcome. An interesting thing because it was Philip who would be the one to take the gospel to the Samaritans to begin with. And the Lord wants us to understand this. If you are going to do what I told you to do, if you're going to do what I commanded you to do, you cannot have your partiality, you can't have your prejudice. You take the gospel to everybody, wherever they are, no matter where, if they are on this earth, and in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, the waters keep going, the circle in the water keeps going, doesn't it? And to the uttermost parts of the earth, anywhere there's a human being on this world, on this earth, we take the gospel to them. And so the scripture said, immediately after the Lord had given them the divine mandate, the Great Commission, he was taken up into the clouds. He ascended into heaven. In the Gospels and the book of Acts, there are 20 references to the ascension of Jesus Christ. And there are 13 different words to describe his ascension into heaven. It's amazing. They're out there, and the Lord has given them the divine mandate. And as they stand there, quicker than they know, faster than they can think, the Lord has taken up from them. You know what the beauty of that is? When the Lord was resurrected, nobody was there to see him come out of that tomb. They found it empty the next morning. They found a stone rolled away. But nobody saw him until he appeared to them at a later time and in different places. But when the Lord was ascended into heaven, they were there and they saw it. And when the angels would ask them, why stand you gazing up into the heaven? I have to admit, I think I would be doing the same thing. Because for the first time ever, a human being, no matter that he was a son of God, no matter that he was a savior, defied the law of gravity and went up through the clouds, on past the stars, into the land of glory, through the gates that I guarantee they opened to welcome him into his heavenly home, down the streets with a host of heavenly angels watching him, welcoming him, and on to the Father, his heavenly Father, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And now, since he's at the right hand of the Father, we have an advocate, we have a lawyer who's sitting right there, and we'd better have one, because every day, the accuser of the brethren, the scripture says, you know who that is, goes before the Lord, look at your pet Christian down here, ah, look at him, listen to, did you see what they just did? Did you hear what they just said? And all the time, when Satan is throwing his darts at you, our blessed Lord as our advocate is sitting there saying, it's okay, it's okay. It, they've gotten it under the blood, all is forgiven, all is okay. He is our advocate, he is our mediator, he is our high priest. The high priest had one job, communicate God's word to men, communicate men's word to God. As our mediator, our Lord is there, at the right hand of the Father. And everything that we need, the scripture says, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Not arrogantly, but we can come boldly because we believe we belong there. We have a right to be there because Jesus Christ is our high priest. And he says, come unto me, all ye that heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so he is our advocate, he is our mediator, but more importantly, he is our intercessor. Do you know, I hope you know, he's there every day and he's praying for you. Do you know he's praying for you? He is, our he is there to intercede on our behalf 
and he gives us the same privilege as the Lord Jesus Christ prays for us, so we are to pray for one another. We are to be there on the behalf of one another. And whatever else anybody says about this church, I'll tell you this. These are praying people. This is a praying church. It's not the only thing they are, but this is a praying church. And make no mistake about it, Jesus Christ is there, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And the beauty of it all, the two angels who apparently just decide to hang around for a while, they're watching everybody there on the ground stargazing. They're watching them looking, they are paralyzed. They are just so in awe at what they see. The Lord Jesus taken up. His battle-scarred body is now where only loving hands will ever touch it. No, make no mistake about it. And so the angels say to those who are standing around, why stand ye here gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus who is taken up from you is going to come back just like you've seen him go. One day he's going to come in the air and as believers we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But one day, another day, he's coming back to that same Mount of Olives. And brother, when he sets his foot on the earth that time, it's going to be all over. It will be all over. And the beauty of it is, when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Where he goes, we go. When he comes back, we come with him. There will never be a time when we're separated from him anymore. Not ever. Not ever. And the Lord wants you to understand today that if you really believe that, and sure you do, this same Jesus who's taken up from you is going to come back in the, just like you've seen him go up. And when he does, and when he does, and he comes in the air, we'll be caught up to meet him. But until he does, we have an unfinished task. We've got work to do. We have a world to win. And that will never change. By the way, just so you know, when the Lord does come, we already know, the church is not going to have fulfilled that divine mandate. There will still be those who will witness after the church has taken to be with the Lord. I want to tell you, I noticed something interesting as I read this scripture. When I said earlier, and you read it in chapter, of verse 15 of this chapter, there were 120 people in the upper room. After this angel had gone to be with the Lord, joined him in heaven, the disciples decided, you know, probably we need to form a plan. Uh, we need to have a meeting. So let's go into the upper room. Favorite place of theirs. Good place to meet. And the scripture says there were 120 there at that time. What I find interesting is this. The apostle Paul said at one time while the Lord was on earth, there were 500 people who saw him. What I want to understand is, let me get that straight. At one time, in that 40-day period, there were 500 people who saw the Lord. 500 witnesses, 500 people who knew. But when it came time to meet in the upper room, there were 120 people. My question is, what happened to the three-fourths of the ones who had already seen a loving Savior? So much for commitment, so much for loyalty, so much for dedication, when 380 people can't even be faithful for 40 days or less. I'll share this with you. Some years ago, some of you were here when Mark Stone, the evangelist, came and shared several times, as a matter of fact, in revival. And he said this, when he pastored a church, London Bridge Baptist Church in Virginia Beach, 
a tremendous church, a powerful church. They were in revival. And I don't know who the evangelist was, but when it came time to give the invitation, I've always said this, if I want you down here at the altar, I'll get you down here. We'll stay here until you get here, if we have to. We'll sing just as I am, as Grady Nutt said, until he just about wasn't. I can get you down to the altar. But this evangelist said something that um, just amazing. He said, everybody who wants to be a soul winner, come down here. That's like asking everybody who loves your mother to stand up. What believer, what person in the church is not going to acknowledge that they want to be a soul winner? Who in the church is going to say, no, I don't want to be a soul winner? Maybe we're not going to do it, but at least we're not going to make it public. We're not going to say that. And he said, there were people in the aisles, they were down the side of the church, and he said the evangelist leaned over to him and said, you're going to have to build a bigger church. And he said, my only answer was, we'll see you. The next week, when it came night, the night for visitation, 20 people showed up for visitation. There were, he said, over 400 people standing in the aisles, down the middle, over on the side, everywhere, who said one night they wanted to be a soul winner. And about four nights later, there were 20 of that 400 people who showed up. I'm here today to tell you, Philip Bliss wrote the song, Let the Lord Lights Be Burning. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from the lighthouse evermore. But to us he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. The lighthouse tells people at sea where the land is. The upper lights in, the, in that lighthouse tell people where the land is. The lower lights tell people where the danger is. Let the lower lights be burning. Send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue, you may save. He is asking us to send the gleam across the wave. Let the lower lights be burning. Tell the people to come to the light of all lights, Jesus Christ. But tell them also, that they need, they absolutely need, to tell, warn people about the dangers of this world, of the dangers of this life. It's interesting because in the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, in verse 37, the disciples tell the Lord, who is about to go into another area, Lord, all of the people are looking for you. Everybody needs you. There are cripples. There are the blind. There are the people who are deaf and dumb. Lord, all the people are looking for you. And his answer was simply this. Let us go into the next town that I may preach the gospel there. For therefore came I forth. In other words, Jesus made it abundantly clear. I didn't come down here to entertain people. I didn't come down here to heal everybody. To be sure, he did heal people. To be sure, he did have compassion for those who were desperately in need of the touch of the master's hand. But that wasn't his primary reason for coming. He didn't come to do miracles. He didn't come to ooh and ah the crowd. He came to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And when Dr. Luke said, the former treaties, O Theopolis, have I given of all that Jesus began to do and to say. Jesus just began to do it and to say it. Now he holds us responsible and accountable for getting the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's the only reason we are in existence today. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, and I'll say it until the Lord calls me home. Any church 
who does not have as their mission, as their passion, what Pam Johnson had, to bring people into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ will have a tough time justifying their existence. Any church who's not in the soul winning business, any church who doesn't give people the opportunity, the invitation to come to the Lord, what's, what's the purpose? What's the point? What are you there for? How do you dispute, how do you deny what the Lord has told you to do? How do you transfer that to somebody else and still call yourself a church? You cannot do it. You cannot do it. And you've heard me say this, as long as God gives me breath, there will not be a service of any kind when people, first of all, do not hear the gospel, and second of all, are not given the invitation to trust Christ publicly as their Savior. Because everybody the Lord ever saved, everybody he ever called, he called publicly. Salvation is a private matter, but it is not. It's a personal matter, but it's not a private matter. If you are ashamed to confess him before men, he will be ashamed to confess you before your Father which is in heaven. And so the decision is yours. Let the Lord lights be burning. Send the gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. Our worship leader will come as we prepare for the invitation. And this invitation this morning is first of all, and foremost of all, to anyone who has never trusted Christ as their Savior. I am happy for anybody who has good fortune in life. I really am. I'm always pleased when anyone has a special blessing poured out on them. I'm always happy for people who reach a milestone in their life, whatever it may be. But my heart grieves if that person has never trusted the Lord as our Savior. Because I tell you this, I said it before, I say it again. If you have everything and you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. You have nothing. If you have nothing and you have Jesus, you have everything. It's that simple. It's all about Jesus. And I want you to know today, I'm inv inviting you this morning in the spirit of our Lord, but I'm inviting you also in the spirit of Pam Johnson, who is right here this morning and always will be. She bodily has been taken from us. And I can tell you last September, Carol and I were planning to go to Lancaster and we heard about the critical condition that Pam was in. And we wondered, would she live for the three days until we got back? Little did we know that nine months later, the Lord would call her home. I tell you that to tell you this, nobody is going anywhere until the Lord says so. Nobody. And this morning, you have a golden opportunity. You have a golden opportunity. And all you have to say is this, I want to be a Christian. I want to be saved. And what you're really saying is the song we're going to sing. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. All the material things are good. They really are. God bless it, you for what you have. But I'm telling you today, I hope you're saying from your heart, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Because right now, I want to tell you, Jesus is watching and Pam is watching. And you'd better answer up as we sing, would you stand?
Father, we speak from personal experience when we say that Jesus Christ is the best thing that ever happened to us. We just know that the blessings keep coming, the joys keep unfolding, and the reality of the Lord's return becomes more precious to us with every passing day. It's because of Jesus Christ that we can rejoice even as we are grieving to know that Pam is with the Lord. She has been freed from the bondage that has been a part of her life for the last five years. Now she has only eternity with the Lord. The place where former things are passed away and all things are made new. No more sorrow, no more death, no more grieving, no more pain, no more crying. Only the love of our Lord and his blessed presence. Thank you today in Jesus' loving name. Amen. things I share with you before we dismiss. First of all, you probably have realized there's a fly been circling <laughs> around here and Francis had a fly swatter. She said, if he lands on your head, I got him. And so, uh, Harold, I see he came to pay you a visit. Rebecca, I know he came over you, so you all can have it. Don't worry about as long as you see the fly if he's flying around my head. If he disappears, then you have reason to be concerned. <laughs> That's uh, I want you to know. But the last year, last year and a half, has really been a, a challenge for the church. It has for all of us. And it, for an, in a different way, it has for me. And I've just given everything I know to lead the church during that time, but I'm ready for a break. And I'll be taking that the next two Sundays. I'm leaving it to Jonathan and, and Paul to take care of things on Sunday morning on Wednesday night, I'm taking, leaving it to you to take care of things on Sunday morning, Wednesday night. And uh, I'm just looking forward to this time to uh, just be renewed and, and revived and refreshed and whatever else I need to be. So I just ask you to be faithful in my absence and uh, I do look forward to being back and I so enjoy sharing God's word. Uh, but I do know that the Lord told some of the people come ye apart. And it was Vance Havner that said, if you don't come apart, you will come apart. And so I uh, thank you this morning for your faithfulness and your love and just ask you to just honor the commitment that you've made to the Lord. And with that in mind, I don't know anything else we could say that'd be more precious. Anything that would echo the spirit of Pam this morning as we are dismissed than simply to say, people need the Lord. People need the Lord. Amen. Amen.